Welcome to Broadmoor Community Church. It is a glorious and beautiful morning here. I hope it is true for you as well. I am Reverend Ann Cubbage, and it is my privilege and honor to be the senior pastor with this amazing congregation that includes you. Those of you who are sitting on your couch, who are on vacation, who just didn't want to come to church or you live too far away, please know that I include you as part of our congregation. And I would be in partnership with you as we pray together for this church and its ministries, as we pray together for our world. If you would like to know more, please know that there are slides at the end of the service that you can find out how to reach me, how to pray for and with us, and how to participate in small groups that includes for children and youth. As we move into October, here we are in the midst of fall. I went out the other day and saw glorious aspen colors. I hope wherever you are, you have something beautiful to remind yourself of all that God has done for and with us in this beautiful world that God created. As we go into worship today, I would invite you to think about all of the blessings in your life, to think about all of the ways that you want to share those blessings because you know that the world is in need and you are living in God's abundance. As we walk the holy way, this is our last work week on that particular project, but I would invite you to consider how your traveling on this journey on the holy way has been fulfilling, has been filled with detours, and will continue for the rest of your life. Let us go into worship. Holy and loving God, I ask that you would be with us as we continue this journey, that you would guide us, direct us, pull us up out of the ditches, help us to know the way to go, and help us have the courage to take those steps. Because sometimes we look at the opportunities and we think about the possibilities and we get nervous. Fill us with your spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Guide my feet while I run this race. little school bus. It reminds me of the days that I used to ride a bus. How many of you ride a bus? Yeah, not as many as I probably would have thought, but maybe someday you will. I'm Pastor Ann, and as I think about the school bus, I remember the driver. The driver always had to go one particular direction because otherwise nobody would know what time the school bus was coming. And the school bus driver always went to the same houses at about the same time every day. And that way the parents could help get the kids on the bus or off the bus. So what would happen if he suddenly decided, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna go to a different house tomorrow. I'm not going to the same houses because it's too boring or because those kids don't ever hardly get on anyway. We would all be in trouble, wouldn't we? Well, that's exactly what happens to us, all of us who are followers of Jesus. We have a certain way that we're going. 
there are certain rules that we follow and a certain direction. And when we get off, when we forget where we're going, we get lost, then God comes and says to us through our parents or our friends or our teachers, come with me. Let me show you the better way. I call this way that Jesus has led us the holy way. We are on a holy journey. Our entire lives we're on this journey. And we're going to get mixed up. And we're going to forget. And we're sometimes going to go to a different house. And when that happens, God is like the great bus driver. And God will come and pick us up. And God will take us to the places that God knows we should go in order that we can learn, that we can follow, and that we can be more like Jesus. Can you do that? It's hard. Will you say a prayer with me? Dear God, thank you. Thank you for giving us the way. Thank you for showing us the way. Help us to follow your son Jesus on the way as we work to be the best people we can be. We love you, God, and we know you love us. And all God's children said, Amen. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, but we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. When I was in fifth grade, several, several of the girls in my class, along with Mr. Langdon, our teacher, decided to throw an end of the year party for the class. There was much excitement as the day approached. However, on the day of the party, Rachel, not a person on the planning committee, and a townie to boot brought a bag of candy for the party. I can remember the whispers and the glares even today. The party committee could not believe that someone had dared to make forays into their turf. How dare she bring something to share? To their party. Do you suppose those party planning girls felt that bag of candy was a statement of some failure, some lack of planning on their part? Were they afraid that they might lose some respect or some amount of power if Rachel's offering was accepted? Were they nervous that the barriers they had so carefully constructed might be cracking and their control of who was out and who was in was at risk. How often we humans find ourselves part of those same type turf wars. We place ourselves at the entrance to the holy way in order to check credentials. John, the beloved disciple, checked credentials. We heard, teacher, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. It is that last word of his phrase that is the key, us. The problem was not that the unauthorized exorcist was leading folks away from Jesus, for John himself said that the man was using Jesus' name. Oh no, the problem was that the man was not one of us. He had no credentials. Jealousy and rivalry are to be found everywhere, but in some way, unfortunately, 
They are the special provenance of religious and holy people. I have known many holy people who were doing good work, but who got most upset when others did the same. There are some who establish little kingdoms of love, but woe to the person who steps into that kingdom unannounced or uninvited. For example, I have been in churches and in places where there's disgruntlement when another food pantry is set up or another woman's circle is set up or another group decides to put on a potluck. Can you imagine? There's a story about two businessmen who were great rivals. One got a computer, the other got two. When one got a cell phone, the other got two. When one built a storehouse, the other built two. One day, an angel appeared to one of them and offered, you can ask for anything you like and you will get it. Sounded more like a genie to me. However, your rival will get two of whatever you ask for. You mean the man asked, if I ask for a million dollars, I would get it? Yes, you would, answered the angel, but your rival will get two million. How soon do I have to answer, asked the businessman. I will be back tomorrow morning for the answer, the angel said. That night, the businessman tossed and turned, but when the angel came back, he had his answer ready. I will settle, he said, for one blind eye. Jealousy raised its ugly head in today's reading as well. Jesus' disciples want to make themselves sole distributors of God's liberating love. These disciples missed the wonder of God's transforming power. Their assumption that only those who are one of us can do signs of wonder and healing blinded them to God's presence in others. Rather than being grateful that demons were cast out, they were upset that this was done through someone outside their group. Jesus' response to the complaint is clear. Do not stop him. Centuries before, when Joshua, who had been Moses' aide, thought it his job to check credentials by saying, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Moses stopped them. Moses' response then was, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Wow. Can't you imagine the elders and later the disciples' thoughts? We thought we were the chosen few. We thought we were the only ones with the keys to the kingdom. What do you mean whoever is not against us is for us? Do you mean that any Tom, Dick, or Sally might actually be anointed by God's Spirit to walk the holy way and spread good news? Do you mean to say that credentials are not needed? Do you mean to say that those Pharisees might not be so bad? Do you mean to say, Jesus, that those fundamentalist evangelicals might really be on our team? You cannot mean that they might mean us. By recognizing the legitimacy of the exorcist's work, the disciples are forced to acknowledge that Jesus' transformative power extends beyond their own inner circle. The knowledge that others might effectively engage in ministry invites the disciples and us to consider the existence of a wider faith community. We are called to recognize and rejoice in the good work of other believers who walk the holy way, not just within the confines of our church, nor the boundaries of our denomination. Therefore, we must trust others to provide those things that we are unable to provide, to say those words that seem foreign to us, to do those things for which we have no gifts. Jesus seeks to expand the boundaries of those who are us to include as many people as possible. This revelation also serves to remind the disciples that their capacity to accomplish any work is found in God's power alone, 
not by their own abilities, not by their status as one of Jesus' disciples. They are forced to remember their own failure to heal just days earlier. The disciples are forced to reconsider the barriers, the stumbling blocks they may have inadvertently erected in their efforts to protect their teacher and their status. What stumbling blocks have we erected that prevent the flourishing of God's kingdom? Might it be as simple as our barbed comments overheard in the restaurant after worship? It makes people wonder, why should I go to a church whose members speak about other members like that? Or perhaps, what are some of the subtle ways in which the church sabotages its own ministries? Could it be the stated desire in every church to have more young families, but the passive resistance to staffing the classes and activities for those very children? And are the goals of our boards and committees in conflict with each other due to ownership battles? Clovis Chapel, a minister from about a century ago, used to tell the story of two paddle boats. They left Memphis about the same time, traveling down the Mississippi River to New Orleans. As they traveled side by side, Sailors from one vessel made a few remarks about the snail's pace of the other. Words were exchanged, challenges were made, and the race began. Competition became vicious as the two boats roared through the deep south. One boat began falling behind. Not enough fuel. There had been plenty of coal for the trip, but not enough for a race. As the boat dropped back, an enterprising young sailor took some of the ship's cargo and tossed it into the ovens. When the sailors saw that the supplies burned as well as the coal, they fueled their boat with material they had been assigned to transport. They ended up winning the race, but burned their cargo. How often do we burn our cargo in efforts to win? God has entrusted cargo to us children, families, neighbors. Our job is to do our part in seeing that this cargo reaches its destination. What is keeping the church from discerning the will of God and pursuing Christ's ministry? Are we clinging to a self-identity that no longer reflects its membership or a vision that no longer holds relevance? How can our church become spirit-led and miracle-producing rather than ego-driven, cargo-burning, jealous gatekeepers? I have read book after book of congregations whose members love to loathe those huge megachurches that are being built on the edges of towns. Although they never bother to visit those congregations, they pride themselves on their high liturgy and lofty intellectualism and condemn those megachurches for worshiping in a manner they consider shallow. Instead of responding to the successes of the neighboring churches with a reevaluation of their own programs, those churches in town cling to old habits and in so doing increase only in bitterness and self-righteousness rather than in membership and ministry. What opportunities are missed because too many like the disciples, consider these megachurches to be competition rather than partners in Christ's service. The disciples, peeved at being unsuccessful exorcists, see an outsider successfully driving out demons in Jesus' name. They are jealous that this man is functioning where they failed, and they hope that Jesus will refuse to recognize him and perhaps even condemn him. It is as if their own self-esteem will be reinforced if the outsider is rejected. But Jesus is not threatened by goodness outside his own circle, and he does not try to control the doing of good. Instead, he invites these insecure disciples to a wider vision, to a recognition of God's goodness exhibited by persons, 
persons with or without credentials, persons like my fifth grade classmate, Rachel. We too are invited to a wider vision, a recognition of God's goodness exhibited by persons beyond our own communities, by persons with and without credentials who walk the holy way. May we, th may we this day open our eyes and our hearts to all of the miracles of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. probably noticed that when it comes time to prayer time, I'm always, always in this chair. It is my place of prayer, my quiet space. And if you haven't found a spot, find a place that you can feel connected, that you can ground yourself in God's being. At this time, I would invite you to a time of silence. And then I will say prayers of the people and we will join together in the Lord's Prayer. The words will be on your screen. Let us pray. Amazing, caring, beautiful, creating God. We come to you today knowing 
that you have created us all in your image. Help us to live into that. As we walk the journey of life on your holy way, help us stay on the road. Help us to know the direction that we should go and help us to follow that direction. We come today, God, with concerns on our hearts for our loved ones, those who are facing surgeries or ill health, financial problems, spiritual or psychological issues. God, we ask that you would bring comfort to their lives and help us to know how we can best be the love that you have shared with us. We are concerned also about so many people in our world who are hungry and thirsty, terrified because of the war-torn nature of their own countries or because of the violence that is perpetuated against them. God, we ask that you would be with them. And again, help us to know how we can share your love, even across oceans. And God, we have joys, joys that we come to you with saying thank you. Thank you for all of the blessings and all of the care that you have given us. As we reach out to others today, we do it in your name. And we say thank you for the example of your son, Jesus the Christ, and so many others throughout the millennia that have shown us how to walk in your way. And we pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is the cry of my heart to follow you. It is the cry of my heart to be close to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. Teach me your holy ways, O oh Lord, so I can walk in your truth. As we go from this place out into our everyday lives, I invite you to take with you the knowledge that God is with you always and everywhere, that the Holy Spirit will guide and direct you, and that because of the love of God through Jesus the Christ, we are a forgiven and whole people. Let us go into the world. Mm -hmm.